Welcome to Rate of Reaction and Rate Laws. Here we have two reactions that you're probably familiar with. We have the rusting of iron and the burning of coal. Both of these reactions are exothermic reactions, meaning that they both release heat. And for the burning coal, that probably makes sense. You probably would not want to stick your hand into the burning coal, because you know that that would probably be pretty painful. But you probably wouldn't hesitate to touch a piece of iron that was rusting. And in fact, you really can't even measure the temperature change of the iron as it rusts, even though this rusting process is releasing heat. Well, if they both release heat, why is one of them not harmful and the other one is? And the answer to that has to do with how quickly it releases the heat. The burning coal is exothermic and also very fast, so the heat produced comes out all at once, whereas the rusting of iron takes a very long time. So that heat that's released by the rusting reaction is slowly released over a long amount of time. And that makes it so that you can't really even tell that there's a temperature change in the iron. So then the question is, why do some reactions happen quickly and other reactions happen slowly? And the answer to that has to do with collision theory. So let's take a look at the reaction of A and B to form AB. Here I have a container, and I'm going to fill this container with my reactant particles, like so. So my container is now filled with reactants A and B. As those reactants are constantly moving around and colliding with each other, every now and then you're going to have a successful collision, and A and B is formed. And I could have a number of these successful collisions. There's another one, there's another one, there's another one, and all of a sudden I have a product being formed in this container. So if I'm going to describe the speed at which AB is being formed, this product is being formed, that depends on how many collisions there are in general, and the fraction of those collisions that are successful. In other words, the rate of reaction is equal to the number of successful collisions that occurs in a certain amount of time. So number of successful collisions divided by the total amount of time. Now there's a slight problem with this definition. While it's technically true, it's very difficult to count the number of successful collisions because there are so many particles in any given sample. It's just not realistic to count atoms that are colliding. So because we can't measure the number of collisions by counting, we instead measure other things, such as a color change. Let's say that the B molecules were blue, but AB is colorless. That means at the start of this reaction, this container would be filled with blue particles. And as the reaction proceeds, the blue would slowly go away as the B molecules are used up, and the container would start becoming colorless, because the product is colorless. So we can measure the rate of color change, the speed at which this blue color fades. Another thing we can measure the change of is the change in pH. So if either A or B is an acid or a base, as it's consumed, the pH is going to change. And we can look for the change in pH over a certain amount of time. That's another way to look at reaction rate. Again, we're simply looking for measurable changes. So the most common one that we actually end up using is concentration. And that can be the concentration of the reactant, or the concentration of the product. So because concentration is the most common thing we use to measure reaction rate, let's take a closer look at how to use concentration data to find the rate of reaction for this particular reaction. A and B gives you AB. Now obviously this reaction is made up, so I just made up some data to go along with it. So in this data table, the time goes from zero to a minute and a half, and we're given the concentration of A, the concentration of B, and the concentration of AB in moles per liter. So just for the sake of ease, we're going to pretend that the container I did this reaction in was one liter. That way we can just treat all these numbers as just moles. So let's say I want to measure the rate of this reaction in terms of how much product is formed over time. That means the rate is going to be equal to the change in the concentration of AB in a certain amount of time, the change in time. So let's plug in some numbers and see what this looks like. The change in concentration of AB. Well, let's look at where AB ended up. That's 0.8. So I have 0.8 moles. And where did it start? It started at 0. So 0.8 minus 0 moles divided by the change in time for where that change in concentration happened. So the time where it was 0.8 is 1.5 minutes. So I'm going to take 1.5 minutes and subtract the initial time, which was 0. And if I evaluate this expression, it's going to give me the rate of formation of this product. So this becomes 0.8 over 1.5, or 0.53 moles per minute. This is the rate of AB. 
And we could do the same calculation for A or B, and it would just be the rate at which they're disappearing. Because we see A goes from 2 down to 1.6, and B goes from 1 to 0.6. So these are obviously decreasing in concentration because they're being used up to make AB. But these rates, no matter what you calculate, are always going to be written as positive values. So even if you end up with a negative value, like if you did the same process for A, you would get a negative value, you still write it without the negative sign because the rates are always treated as positive values. That wraps up our lesson on rate of reaction. To learn more about rate of reaction and rate laws, continue watching. Let's start by looking at this case again. We calculated the overall rate for the formation of AB. I say overall rate because we use the final value and the initial value. However, you may notice that if you look at the individual steps, so from zero to half a minute, from half a minute to one minute, and from one minute to a minute and a half, these rates for each of these steps are going to be different. And you could calculate them pretty quickly. This first one's going to be 0.5 minus zero over half a minute minus zero minutes. That's going to give us a rate of one. This next one's going to be 0.7 minus 0.5 over 1 minus 0.5, which is going to give us point, a rate of 0.4. And this last one is going to be 0.8 minus 0.7 over 1.5 minus 1, and that's going to give us a rate of 0.2. What this is showing us is that as the reaction proceeds, the rate is not constant. And the reason it's not constant is that it depends on the concentration of the reactants. You'll notice that the rate is decreasing but so is the concentration of the reactants. These are both decreasing as well. So there's a connection between the concentration of the reactants and the rate of reaction that we're going to explore further. Let's look at a few cases to see the relationship between reaction rate and concentration. So say I have, for reactants A and B, one molecule of A and one molecule of B. There is one possible collision between these two particles. Next, let's say I have two molecules of A and two molecules of B. If I look at the possible collisions for this case, I have one here, one here, one here, and one here. So that's four possible collisions. Now let's look at one more case. I have one molecule of A and three molecules of B. Here's one possible collision, here's another, and here's another. So in this case, I have three collisions possible. So you might start to see that there is some relationship between the possible collisions that could occur and the number of reactant molecules that are present. More specifically, you can see that the number of possible collisions is a product of multiplying the number of reactant molecules. So 1A times 1B gives one collision possible. 2A times 2B gives four collisions possible. 1A times 3B gives three collisions possible. This leads to something called the law of mass action. And the law of mass action says that for a single step reaction, the rate is proportional to the product of the concentrations of the reactants. We can write that by saying that the rate is proportional, this symbol means proportional, to the concentration of A times the concentration of B. I can change this proportion to an equality by saying the rate is equal to a constant of proportionality K times A times B. And this statement right here, this is called a rate law. It basically says the rate of reaction is equal to this value K, which is called the specific rate for the equation, times the concentration of the reactants. In general, if K is large, the reaction is going to be fast. If K is small, the reaction is going to be slow. Let's take a more general look at what rate laws are. Rate laws, in general, look like this. The rate is equal to, again, we have the specific rate constant, times the concentration of reactant 1 raised to the m power, times the concentration of reactant 2 raised to the n power. m and n, these two exponents, are called reaction orders. A higher order, so if m was, say, 2, and n was, say, 1, that means that reactant 1 has a larger impact on the rate of reaction than the concentration of reactant 2. So reaction orders give information as to how the rate is affected by the concentration of each reactant. If we look back at the example we just did, 
there's a rate equals k times a times b, notice there is no exponent written here. And that's because the exponents are 1. So for this example we did, m and n are both equal to 1. So they are there, they're just not written, because we don't write the exponent of 1. Now there are specific statements we can make based on this reaction order. We can say that the reaction is first order in A, because A has an exponent of 1. We can also say that this reaction is first order in B, because it has a reaction order of 1. And the last thing we can say is that this reaction is second order overall. So if you add up all the reaction orders for the reactants in the rate law, you can get the overall order of the reaction. So this reaction is second order overall. Now a couple useful things to know about reaction orders. The first is that they're sometimes the same as the coefficients in the balanced chemical reaction. Not always, but sometimes they are. They're usually 0, 1, or 2, but they could be fractions or negative sometimes. But the most important thing is that their values are always determined experimentally for any reaction.